to stay standing as we read from God's word. This is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good uh, Thanksgiving weekend morning. I am thankful that I get to see all of you. And that's probably as much of a Thanksgiving tie-in that this message is ever going to get right there. I'm just thankful to see you all. Um, If you're brand new this morning and you're like, man, I heard the pastor here is young. Uh, He's not this young. Uh, I'm not the lead pastor here. My name is Zach Graves. I'm the next generation pastor here at Doxa Church. And that means that I have direct uh, support for, I I deliver direct support for Doxa Kids Discipleship, and then I have direct leadership and stewardship over Doxa students, which is junior high and high school. And so if you haven't met me before, if you're a parent, if you're a student, if you're brand new, whatever it is, I'm going to be standing in the hallway. I would love to meet you this morning. Well, for those who are regular Doxa attenders, let me assure you from the get-go, you're not crazy. We did just read from a different book of Timothy. You're not crazy. We're reading from 2 Timothy this morning, and I could say that we're taking a one-week break from our 1 Timothy series, but rather what I would say is that we're taking a one-week amplification of our 1 Timothy series. We're actually going to cover concepts that we've seen for a lot of our first stint through 1 Timothy, reflected here in 2 Timothy. It's a great little juncture for us to go to because the context is practically the same. Just written a few years after the letter to 1 Timothy, written to the same Timothy, Paul has the similar encouragement for Timothy. In actuality, this passage is not just an amplification of our First Timothy series. It's also kind of a cool crossroad connection with what we cover on Wednesday night with Doxa students. So this is where worlds collide here today, this morning. Each fall, we spend time with our Doxa students, taking them through their entire Bible, cover to cover. Pretty crazy, right? Like Genesis to Revelation every single fall. Like three months. Three months Genesis to Revelation. How's that even possible, right? Uh, We do this by studying biblical theology. Biblical theology is the study and survey of themes in the Bible in order to see how the Bible is a unified story that points completely to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Some have theorized that there are about 20 main themes in your Bible and 70 other sub-themes that support those main themes. And Pastor Michael and myself have made it our goal, our mission, to find each of those themes and to be able to teach them to our students and subsequently our whole church. And the reason why we do this, the rad part of this, is when you study these themes, you come out of that study with the assets to understand where that theme pops up in Scripture. You actually get to see like how uncharted, unexplored territory in your Bible that never made sense to you, how it's completely highlighting the gospel of Jesus Christ. I actually still, to this day, I'll get texts, sometimes in service, which is because they're listening to the message, sometimes in service, sometimes out during the week, from students and graduated students that are like, I understand this. Like, I'm in Jeremiah, I never understood what was going on before, but the theme of temple is here, and I can see it. And so they get encouraged to read their Bible all the more. By them, you get the keys 
to biblical literacy. By them, you get to see the gospel of Jesus Christ put on full display. And this isn't secret knowledge or anything. It's how your Bible is written. We're just modern readers, and so we tend to not think as we ought when we open it up. So what we've been doing with students this year in 2021 is surveying the theme of work and rest. So allow, us, allow me to give us a brief introduction to that theme. The Bible begins by establishing work and rest firmly in Yahweh, the God of Israel. God is the first worker. Work is not something that comes after the fall. He is the one who is initially working. And we see work and rest as this united whole. Like surely as God works, he creates contexts of rest. The, wor the world is without form and void. It's non-restful. It's non-capable of being inhabited. But then he creates a context that gives life. And surely we see this established in the seventh day at the end of creation. Humans are the first co-workers created by God and commissioned to work creation that God has created. We, we've called it in Docs as students the Eden Initiative. That's what God gives in Genesis 2, the Eden Initiative. And the Eden Initiative is pretty simple. It's make more humans because we need more humans that are image bearers of God, that reflect God's rule and reign, to point to God's glory, and then also steward the resources and the animals that God has given for the sake of accomplishing that mission, for the sake of God's glory. Work, when it's done, creates rest. The purpose of work and rest is to display the glory of God. Work, clearly see, we see that within the, the creation account in general. We understand that rationally, but the Bible actually wants to press you into that. See, as you read further and you get to the book of Numbers, as we see the, Levit the Levitical priesthood established, we see the Levites described in their work the same way that Adam is described in his work. The wording is the same in Hebrew, to work or to guard and to keep. That is Adam's work. The Levites also imitate Adam by working in a Garden of Eden. The tabernacle and temple is a depiction of the garden. It's oriented the same way. It's made up of similar materials. It's shaped and fashioned to reflect the Garden of Eden. True work displays the glory of God. But anti-work attempts to take away from it. Anti-work removes rest, and surely that's what we see creation then go into. Adam and Eve rebel, and we get futility. We get struggle. We get strife. Have you ever noticed that the curse is on their work? Adam's work becomes hard. Eve's work becomes hard. And those that image Adam and Eve also have hard work. But thankfully, humans are not the main story of the Bible. Did you know that? God is the main, story, main character of the Bible. And because God is the main character of the Bible, he is working to renew his creation just the same way as he did in Genesis 1 and 2. And God still desires human, God, covenant partnership, cooperation, and so he establishes these things called the covenants, joint partnership work projects that are ultimately based on God's faithfulness. As we proceed through the theme, we see it over and over again. There's work, there's covenant language, there's priestly work that's done, there's garden contexts that blossom out of everywhere, and then finally we see the ultimate covenants appear within the God-man, Jesus Christ. He is perfect covenant partnership. He is the human one who truly can partner with God, and he also is truly the same God. He is both. Jesus is the ultimate worker. He perfectly fulfills the Father's will, and he also is ultimate rest, giving rest from sin and giving us now an opportunity by his spirit to be faithful covenant cooperators. By trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get that as your story as well. Like, whatever strife and futility you struggle with, like, the gospel of Jesus Christ enters into that. We can have the benefits of Jesus being faithful covenant worker and perfect rest by belief in him. And if you don't, if you don't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you don't get those benefits. You don't get life. Instead, you actually work anti to against creation. You end up creating contexts that tear away at God's good life. Surely we produce that in struggle and strife and anger and hostility. These are just symptoms of the problem of sin. We focus on self-glory, not God's glory, and therefore God will rightly judge those who live in anti-God 
glory. But that's not what the gospel ultimately offers us. The, go- the gospel offers us an exchange of that for instead salvation, for life we can have in Christ. Now, we've gone on a short little journey as I survey the theme, and you're wondering, okay, that took a while, so how's this connected to 2 Timothy? Well, surely the way biblical themes work in the Bible is they're established in Genesis, they're built out in the Old Testament, they crescendo in Christ, they're applied to the church in the rest of the New Testament, and then we see it close out for God's glory and the church's benefit at the end of time, as we see in the book of Revelation. So clearly, if we're in our Bible and we're in Acts and beyond that, before Revelation, we're in that segment. We're seeing how these things apply to us who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is continuing the theme of work and rest. Paul's showing Timothy, and by connection, you and me and the rest of the church, what it looks like to be a faithful covenant co-worker that we can be by God's Spirit. So Paul has something to say about work, something to say about work that creates rest. And these concepts are tied, like I mentioned, into much of what we covered in 1 Timothy. And this comes at a timely moment. Like we've got, what, like a month left in the year? Can you guys believe it? A month left. Like there's work that still needs to be done. Yeah, praise God. But there's still work to be done. And we hope to also have fulfilling rest in the midst of that work. And so this is a great moment to lean into this. All right, if you're taking notes this morning, big idea. The big idea is that we are invigorated to work hard for the God of the gospel when we remember the gospel. This is what Paul's saying. If, if you ask me to summarize, and you haven't, but I have for you, because it's my job here. So 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, I just got tripped up, chapter 2, 1 through 13, this is exactly what Paul's saying. He's saying that you can be invigorated to work hard for the God of the gospel. In fact, you're commanded to, and you're capable to do so by remembering the gospel. Paul's going to walk us through that in two parts. Part one is going to be the first half of that statement. Part two is the second half of that statement. And as we dive in, Paul's going to lay on the urgency. He's going to use strong examples of what it looks like to work hard in the gospel. For some of you, this may seem exhausting, Like talking about work and how we ought to work hard. This may seem exhausting. You might feel condemned. Like, I don't work hard. I don't compare to this. Maybe for the one who's lost work. Maybe even been wrongfully terminated in this past year. Maybe you're a single mom or a single dad, and you're just like fighting to work hard on all fronts. Maybe you're just relieved that like you're just able to get out of bed this morning. Um, If you're tuned in online, maybe you're still stuck at home for any reason. You're just thrilled to be like tuned in online. That's awesome. Do not feel condemned. Maybe on a lighter note, you you might just be nursing a tryptophan-induced food coma that's just lasted for like two extra days. Three, if you had leftovers this morning as well, which no shame. You got to make those things work for you. But nonetheless, this rah-rah work hard concept, it might seem debilitating to you, but that's not the point. The point is to energize us in the gospel. So don't disengage. Don't be fatigued. Come with me. Come into this text alongside me. Part number one. Paul gives a depiction of invigorated gospel work. Part one. He's going to give a command. He's going to give some examples. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 3 says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul gives three commands specifically to Timothy. It's be strengthened, entrust, and share. Now, what's unique about pastoral epistles, so 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus, is that they're written for the pastor. So truly we have this connection of like for Timothy and for Titus, there's immediate application. For the pastor today, there's a more directly connected application, but there is indeed as well a principle for the whole church. It's why we have this in our Bibles. So what's the ethos of this threefold command? What's going on here? Um, I'll give it to you and then I'll show how we see it here in the text. So the command is to take action being dedicated to the cause of Christ. This is what the command is. Take action. 
for, for Timothy, that looks like a specific set of things. He's not only supposed to be strengthened, but he needs to entrust the gospel to faithful elders who will also teach. He must also bear with suffering, just as we can see that we ought to at the end of Romans chapter 8. For Timothy, taking action, being dedicated to the cause of Christ is equipping the church in Ephesus. But for you and for me, it's going to include everything. It's going to include vocational work. It's going to be being a student, whether you are undergrad student, grad school student, you're just still an elementary kind of a student, whether you're a parent, whatever you find yourself doing, you know, that 1 Corinthians 10, 31 principle, whether you eat or drink or anything you do, do all to the glory of God. Working in your context is living out the ethos of this, living for the cause of Christ. And that's going to look like representing excellence, being thankful to God, leaning wholeheartedly into what you do as a demonstration of what the gospel has done in your life. Now, as we look to verse 1, we already get like a note for the faint-hearted here. The first command, be strengthened. Okay, how how do we do that? How do we be strengthened? How's Timothy supposed to do that? Is he going to like put on a hoodie and crank up Eye of the Tiger and like shadow box in the corner? Is that how he's going to be strengthened? I'm going to get amped up that way. Like, no, no, no. What comes right afterwards? By the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Surely this command is, it's a passive command, meaning you are not the one who does it. It is done to you. You let it be done to you. Now, now there's a means to this. That's actually going to come in part two of our text today. But you need to see that even the command itself is a command to engage with the God of the gospel who is doing these things in your life. Now, Paul's going to give three examples to imitate here. Three examples of invigorated gospel work. We're going to talk about a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And we're going to see how each of these examples, it kind of hones in on a specific thing, a specific merit that ought to be applied to our work for the cause of Christ. Example number one that we see in the text is the soldier. And with the soldier, we see this idea of being focused on the mission. Verse 4 says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Soldiers are focused. Like to bolster that focus, they abstain from certain things in order to be locked in on their mission. A Roman soldier at this time would have had a service length of about 25 years. It's a long time. It was it was a career maneuver more than just like an enlisted service for a season. So 25 years, and at that time, they would not strike out on a business venture. They wouldn't even get married during that time. They were forbidden from marriage if they were actively in service. They'd be disconnected as much as they could so that way they could be focused on their mission and fulfilling that mission in order to please their enlisting officer. Now there's a principle here, because surely the command is not to imitate the Roman soldier, but there's an aspect of principle to be drawn out of it. What does it look like for your life to be strengthened and focused on the mission? To be focused on gospel work? Uh, What might you need to remove in order to not get entangled? The word literally means braided. So like braided to the point where like you're stuck and you can't move. What might you need to remove or add in order to stay focused on pleasing your enlisting officer who is Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts? Maybe there's sinful things in your life, that are braiding you up, that are making you incapable of being focused on the mission, these things should be removed. What you watch, what you consume, what you do. And maybe there's disciplines that you ought to enact in order to better, like, focus in on the mission. Standard disciplines, scripture reading, prayer, worship, time in the Lord's house, on the Lord's day. Perhaps there are tasks and content that you engage in that, that they're, they're not sinful things, But the way in which you engage with it, it kind of derails your focus. Like maybe like bad morning habits. Like right out of bed in the morning, you consult your Twitter feed or your stock portfolio. Um, Those are oddly specific for no intended reason. Um, But maybe you do those things (laughs) instead of actually focusing on the gospel or saying a prayer of thanksgiving as you roll out of bed. These things maybe aren't supposed to be completely removed, but they need to be put in their proper place. They need to be organized well. And I found, personally, when that takes place, those things are more enjoyable. You end up being able to focus on your vocation, your recreation, your side hustles, your hobbies, 
all those things end up being more enjoyable when you put them in right order, when you focus on the God of glory first. So the soldier is focused on the mission. Example two is the athlete. The athlete is committed to the rules. Committed to the rules. Uh, That's exactly what Paul says in verse 5. He shows that athletes are committed, and therefore they win glory. They win a crown at the end. They compete according to specific rules in their events in order to win a specific prize. Now, now where the soldier is focused on the mission, and therefore that focus leads to abstaining from certain things, and we've talked about that as also positively adding certain things, the athletes, this focus here in this example, is about adhering to specific standards in order to work well, to work hard. Athletes can't choose to compete by their own rules. Like, they can't just be like, oh yeah, I'm a soccer player, and then they take the field and they behave like it's golf or rather rugby. They just like pick up the soccer ball and they slam into others. Like, I don't know fully all the rules of soccer. I'm just now understanding the offsides rule, but I know that you're not allowed to pick up the ball and just run with it. So soccer players must compete according to certain rules. All athletes must compete well, otherwise they are penalized and won't win the prize. Kristen, did you know that you are also called to compete according to a standard of rules? Like, there are regulations. What does it look like to be a regulation Christian individual? You cannot call yourself a Christian and live a life that does not reflect the law of Christ. You cannot say that you're a Christian but engage being a habitual liar or a slanderer, a gossip, or a thief. Thief of any kind, whether that's like students in here, whether that's thief of knowledge, like cheating on tests, that's being a thief or shady means of income, whatever it would be. Like, you cannot be a thief. Uh, Being a thief of glory at work, whatever that is. You cannot call yourself a Christian and be a practicing fornicator. That's like sexual sin. So you can't say like, oh, I am a believer, therefore I'm engaging as well also into non-marital sexual sin, or even engaging in sexual sin, sexuality that is apart from your spouse in marriage, or homosexual behavior. All these things are not what it looks like to be in Christ. Paul says it this way in Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Later on in Romans chapter 8, to point back to this idea of rules and regulations, Paul says that the righteous requirements of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And therefore, as a regulation Christian competitor, put to death the deeds of the flesh and live in light of the Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 6 that there's regulations for what it looks like. Do you look like the fruit of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? Christians reflect fruit of the Spirit and therefore keep in step with the Spirit. The Christians also have been called to participate in the local church, to engage in the ordinary means of grace, prayer, song, reading of the word, the sacraments, guys, communion. These are ways in which we participate. We strive like an athlete to adhere to the rules because these rules are not arbitrary. It's not like soccer versus rugby. These things are life-giving. And as we compete accordingly, we stay within the cause of Christ. Paul's used this imagery before. We've actually seen it in 1 Corinthians 9. So for those of us who have been here for at least two years, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we am imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. There's that regulation terminology there. Where are you not committed to the rules? Like, where do you see the word reflect what it looks like to be a believer? And you're like, eh, 
don't know about that one. Can I, can I skate around it? Like, don't do that. Like, lean into this. Like, it is a mercy for these things to be revealed to you. Reality is your friend, and the word reveals these things to us to press you back into the gospel, because this work, remember the foundation for this, is that the gospel enables us to be able to engage in this kind of work. It's not what we muster up our self. Example number three that Paul gives, the farmer. The farmer gives a full effort Verse 6 says, it is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Farmers hustle. I think it was one season of Survivor where one of the contestants said, they're strong, and then there's country strong. (laughs) He's right. Like, you throw down. They give a full-on effort. And they know that as they give a full-on effort, there's a proportional reward. There's a byproduct to be enjoyed. They get the first share of the crops. Were the examples of soldier and athlete, they talk about parameters for work, avoiding certain things and adhering to others. The example of farmer speaks to the magnitude. Like, okay, so as we remove things, as we adhere to others, how much, how much intensity do we lay in? It's a full-on effort. Uh, This word for hardworking is often used in a negative sense in Greek. It's used for like toil, struggle, to become weary, overexerted, but when it's used positively, it's like, man, you're given everything to achieve the goal. Now, as we see this, it is very important to remember that Paul gives this as an example because it can be embodied. It is an example to be lived out within our lives. I think that many of us, when we see these types of commands, when it comes to like living out full-on effort, max all the way, we're like, well, we can always give more So I'm probably not doing this command. And you become discouraged by when you see this. You never feel like you're actually heeding the command. You think that it only points out your inadequacy. So other than telling you that that's not the point of this, I want to do my best to kind of flip the paradigm a bit. So if we see work hard with all of our energy is like, ah, well, I I can't do that because I'm not at the best version of myself. I'm not even the best person that's on the planet. I don't have the best assets to put together to do my best efforts, and I'm not even on my best day. If you think of full-on effort in that paradigm, you're not thinking of it rightly. Instead, think of it as what can you do or what ought you do in that moment, in that context, with the resources that you actively have? Like, what does it look like to just, like, lean in and dedicate something Like, isn't that what Christ gives in the parable of the talents? Like, each one gets different amounts, but they apply it in some way. And they get different returns, but they're acknowledged. The one who does nothing is the one who's condemned. So it's leaning in. And also, here's an addition for this. If you find yourself wanting and not reflecting the gospel, what does it look like to flip that context around and reflect the gospel? Now, if those concepts seem conceptual, because they're concepts, uh, the Lord saw fit in your benefit and at my expense to give you an illustration of this. Would you like the illustration? Okay, so earlier, it was a week ago, I was doing the prep work for this lesson. I actually had like written up to this part in the, in the text. So I'd done, you know, weeks of study, and so I'm like putting everything together. And uh, we had company coming over to our house. It was obviously the week before Thanksgiving. I did not want to be behind at all. So I carved out time on a weekend to do some extra work. And as we were working, and my wife, Molly, she was, she was running around cleaning the house. She was getting groceries for our guests to, to be able to not starve while they're at our home for the week. And I noticed that there were dishes that needed to be done. And I was like, okay, that's the thing I want to do. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go clean the dishes. So I go and I I start cleaning the dishes. And I grab a a glass Pyrex bowl. Some of you know where this is going. And I'm going to put it in the dishwasher. And the cart rolls just a little bit. And so it like clips my hand. So I drop the bowl. And it falls on another bowl. And it explodes I don't know what it is with me and glass, but even if it's tempered glass, it does not behave like tempered glass. Like, it was like shards everywhere over the bowl that's there in the bottom area. And and the way glass works is like, you find like a piece of glass five feet the other direction, and you're immediately nervous for like, okay, I gotta lock everything down. Like, we're gonna comb everything. And friends, that was not my idea 
of full-on effort. Like, I would have rather been cleaning the dishes successfully, working on the lesson, helping my wife in other ways, but instead I needed to spend an hour and a half cleaning this up. Not my idea of best effort reality, but full-on effort's not based on possibilities, it's based on what's needed in that moment. I needed to clean glass up. Now, the illustration goes further. Because I mentioned that it looks like doing what you can in that moment, but also looks like redeeming non-gospel contexts. So here's how a non-gospel context was there. Uh, my attitude was plummeting. <laughs> like, each 10-minute interval, it's like exponential, like, down curve. And I was wearing, like, thick rubber gloves, and I still managed to get, like, a spear of glass in my finger. Like, had to pull it out, and it was, it was not great. Um, if my wife did not come home and save me with a morale boost... I would not be here today teaching this lesson. So I could have in that moment said, I'm through. I'm not living out the gospel. I have a bad attitude. I'm not glorifying the Lord. I failed this command. But in actuality, I just set the bar really low. (laughs) What does it look like for the gospel to impact that scenario? Could I at least do it without a bad attitude? That's what it looks like for those things to be flipped around. Friends, you can do this. It's why the example is there. Paul adds in the hope in the midst of this, that like as you do this, there's reward to be had. The farmer has the first share of the crops, and surely as we engage in this discipline, we benefit from God's glorious life. So as we've seen thus far, we've got our commands. Take action. Be committed to the cause of Christ. We've got our examples. Be the soldier. Focus on the mission. The athlete committed to the rules. The farmer work hard, give a full effort, receive the reward. Paul says, think over what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding. Now we move into part two. Part two is the motivation and the foundation. So how are we secured in being able to do these things? He's going to lay that out. Starting in verse eight, Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul immediately shifts into the foundation and the motivation, the why that spurs on the what, the invigorated gospel work that we've just looked at. And he gives the motivation right at the beginning. The motivation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul writes. Like, surely this isn't like a tangent thought to him. Like, surely this isn't filler content. It is the remembrance of the gospel that is Paul's own motivation. And he shows it in a real way. He, like, gets amped up while he's also counting the cost. He's like, remember the gospel. And I know that as I've remembered the gospel, like, I'm in chains because of it. Surely, actually, Paul's writing this letter to Timothy. He writes it again because he writes a second letter because he's about to die. And he's like cranking out work. He's like, I'm going to die for this. I'm bound in chains. But you know what's not bound? The gospel. The gospel ain't bound. The gospel super abounds instead of being bound. The gospel goes forth. And I don't care about my position. That's what Paul says. I'll endure everything for the sake of the elect. Notice how Paul is motivated by the gospel. I think it's a good way to see if we are motivated by the gospel. There's three aspects to this. They're not going to pop up on the screen. They're free of charge this morning. So if you're taking notes, three ways the gospel motivates is that it puts present reality into perspective, it prepares you for future realities, and it focuses you on others. I'm going to go through those one by one and see them here in the text. So first, puts present reality into perspective. We see that by Paul saying, I'm bound, but the gospel is not bound. Present reality into perspective. The gospel shows you that hope's not in circumstance. It's in a living hope who is Jesus Christ. Secondly, it prepares you for future realities. Paul's like, I'll endure everything. Give me whatever you got. Like, I'm ready to go for the gospel. In the gospel, you see that living hope spurs you on to apply it for further action. And then thirdly, it focuses us on others. Paul says that they also may obtain the salvation. In the gospel, you didn't earn anything. 
you were given everything, and therefore you live to showcase that glory, that glorious gift to others. How do you know if you're being motivated by the gospel? Does it look like those three things? Present reality and perspective, prepared for the future, and focused on others. Do you see that throughout your week? And if you find yourself not motivated by the gospel, might I encourage you that you need to know the gospel more? I realize that seems weird. Like, show me somebody who is not motivated, motivated by the gospel. I'll show you a person who does not know the gospel. But it is true. And, and we think of the gospel as like facts. Like, how am I supposed to be motivated on, okay, like I know it. I know that like God is good. Humans create sin. Um, God dies for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He raises from the dead and we get life. Like I know those things, but I'm not like excited by it, but I know them. So what, what do you mean like I need to know them more? Like, no, you know, you, the gospel's more than just facts, friends. The gospel's good news. The gospel is the most epic story that you've ever heard that is true. The gospel is victory over evil. Think about what you're excited by. What, like, TV shows, what novels, book series, whatever it is. What are those things that, like, you can talk about for hours? That's what the gospel's supposed to be. And just like those things became things you talked about because you like, you dove deep and you understood them and you're like excited by them. That's how the gospel is meant to play out in our life. The gospel has vast, vast, vast storehouses of motivation and truth ultimately represented in the glorious work of Christ. So how do you do that? How do you get motivated? How do you know the gospel more? I'm going to give you resources right now. So how do I get more motivated? Uh, First, participate in the life of the church. Friends, I can't even like describe fully to you what takes place. I just know that the Lord does something. But like when you take communion, as you did this morning, like there's something special about it. There's something special about baptism. There's something special about the preaching of the word. There's something special about singing your heart out in worship. These things are meant to bolster your motivation in the gospel. They're meant to remind you of the gospel, to get you to know the gospel deeply. Uh, Get to know some biblical theology. There's my plug-in for like what we do with DOCSIS students. Know the themes of the Bible. And I've given two resources in our Doxologic podcast, and I've had many church members uh, go out of their way to tell me how much they've been enjoying it, so I'm going to give them here as well. And don't take my feedback, but also find others. Two books to better understand biblical theology. Echoes of Exodus by Alistair Roberts. Echoes of Exodus. And What is Biblical Theology by James Hamilton. These two books are going to encourage you to read your Bible. That's, that's how you know when you've stumbled on a good resource. You're not like, this is the Holy Grail and buy it like I understand everything. No, it throws you back into the word. It throws you back into the gospel. That's how you know it's a good resource. Um, also, thirdly, get to know the doctrines of grace. You're not motivated by the gospel because you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand the doctrines of grace. Now, now my journey with the doctrines of grace is multifaceted, so I never had like one resource, but I've heard that Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul is a great resource to like dive into the doctrines of grace. And small groups help curate more resources for all of your small group members. But these things, participation in the church, biblical theology, the doctrines of grace, they reveal the gospel more and help you know it to be motivated by it. Okay, finally, Paul aims to encourage Timothy He wants us to focus on the foundation. What's the foundation for the command, the foundation for the efforts, the foundation for the motivation? He does that by giving us this saying. He says, the saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny us himself. Okay, this, oh, this saying, there's a lot that's going on here. We're only going to cover just like surface level of what's, what's going on here. Uh, Paul is mirroring the tenses that he's talking about. Um, for grammar nerds, it's a, called a chiastic structure. So we got a mirror that's going on here. He's going to go past, present, future. Future's the apex. It turns. It goes back to present. 
And normally you would then go back to past, like if you're going to make the mirror complete and whole, but Paul does it in a really nerdy, cool way. He goes straight to eternity. So he goes past, present, future, present, eternity. That's the flow of what's going on here. It's also connected to other tenses. There are lots of things going on here, but let's stick with just that. That is the main thing. If we can latch on to that, we're going to see something really cool. Both of these things, or all this, I should say, help showcase the gospel and invigorated work. So here's the past components. Paul says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. Paul's like, look to the past. If we've died, we will live. Okay, we saw that in Romans 6, 1 through 4. How can we who have died to sin still live in sin? Do you not know that when you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when you're baptized into the gospel of Jesus Christ, you show that you have died to your old self? So I guess there's a first application there. This is true of you if you believe in the gospel, but that's meant to play itself out in baptism. So if you have not been baptized, get baptized. Baptism is that past action that points to the truly past action, God's work alone, that motivates us and makes us realize that we are in Christ. If we've died with him, we will also live with him. Paul moves to present reality. He says, if we endure we will also reign with him. If we stay, if we abide, if we plant roots like a tree, then we will be assured that we have a blessing of being with Christ in eternity and we'll get to rule and reign with him. It's kind of a cool concept, ruling and reigning. Uh, There is going to be work in new creation. That work, there's actually three ways the Bible talks about it. Reigning's one of them. I'm not going to give you the other two because it's a future lesson for our students, so I can't spoil it for them. That's the end. But there are three ways the Bible primarily talks about eternal work. One of them is reigning. You get to reign alongside Christ. Co-heirs with Christ is what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, if I remember correctly, or 7. It's 5. It's 5. Paul moves from this present reality. If we endure, we will reign to the future reality. If we deny him, he also will deny us. This is speaking of ultimate denial. How do I know that? Case study. Peter, ever heard of him? He's an apostle. Does he deny Christ? Thrice. Does he ultimately deny Christ? No. This is speaking to ultimate denial. Now, we can deny Jesus in words, We can literally say that we don't believe the gospel or we can refuse to speak the gospel when we ought to. We can speak of things other than the gospel as being the gospel. We can also deny Jesus in action. We can live a life that is not according to the rules, like the athlete, contrary to the gospel. And this is saying that if we ultimately live a life like that, then he will deny us because it shows that we never were with him to begin with. We've seen this before, church. 1 John 2, 19 through 20. John says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Ultimate denial shows that you ultimately did not stand in the gospel to begin with. Now now for many, what was supposed to be a trustworthy saying that bolsters your hope, it's like slowly degraded it. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I've, I believe in the gospel and I've been baptized in Christ. Yeah, okay. Oh, you know what? I don't know how well I endure presently. Oh no, have I ever denied and will I deny ultimately? Like it's kind of like dropped you down a few notches. Paul certainly is pressing Timothy and us into action. Work, endure, don't deny. There is work, but it's all on a foundation of the gospel. We must complete Paul's thoughts. If you've been panicked by this, then you need the next verse. Part four is the present reality. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. If you find yourself weighed wanting by Paul saying, you are reminded that your salvation is never about you. It is always about Jesus. Friends, this is the foundation. The foundation is Jesus is forever faithful, even when you are faithless. This is the foundation. The reason for why we can have hope and motivation, the reason why we can adhere to these examples, Jesus is the one doing the work. And Paul lays on this as he like completes the mirroring. 
goes for the eternal reality, for he cannot deny himself. He has never been able to deny himself. This is an eternal reality. Christian, you who trust in Jesus, you have union with Christ. You're united to him. You're the body of Christ. Christ cannot deny his own body. You are united to him. And God will never change his mind. God is unchangeable. He's immutable. That's what that means. Not changing. Incapable of changing. Yes, the omnipotent God cannot do certain things. He cannot change. He never will. Psalm 122, 25 through 27. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? James 1, 17. In God, there's no variation or shadow due to change. Or Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Church, present reality, future commands, future hopes, they're assured in eternal constancy. Our God is eternally constant, and therefore our hope is assured. This should put comfort to your soul. It should ease your anxiety. It should remove your shame. You can lean into hard work knowing that the foundation of that work is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. If you don't have faith in Jesus, put your faith in his finished work. He is God. He is good. He has died for you. Realize that faith, being trust, is about giving up, not mustering up. It's not about you trying to build something in your life. It's about letting go and leaning into the God who has done all the work and then spurs you on to live in echo of that. With the reality of this text and the month of the year left that we have to work as we go into another year, I want us to be motivated for this. I want us to lean into a first action of work, which ought to be worship. So I'm going to read this passage of 1 Thessalonians for us as a spark to lead us into our time of worship together that echoes exactly what we've covered this morning. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Let's worship, church.